So we value the prophetic here. And this morning the Lord has some words for us. Um, I've seen this vision a couple of times over the past week. And this morning I was asking the Lord, is this really a congregational word? And he said, yeah, it really is. What I saw is that there are several people here that are in a certain amount of discomfort. Um, and uh, what I saw is that they'd lost their milk teeth, their baby teeth had come out, and their adult teeth were coming through. Mm. And that um, there was a distraction, because you know how uncomfortable it is to get new teeth? But the Lord was saying that process is healthy, yeah. it's holy, Divine. it's divinely ordained, and He has ordained those mature teeth in which you're going to chew the... The, the meat and the word. He's bringing you into maturity, even though it's very uncomfortable. So, Lord, I just bless the process of coming into maturity and all that you're doing, that it would be a healthy process, a holy process, and a divine and ordained process that you bring those teeth through straight and perfect, Lord. In Jesus' name. Yeah. So the word sustain was on, it's been on my heart all morning, and and the Song of Solomon is 2.5, it says, actually 2.4 and 5, He brought me to the banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. Sustain me with cakes of raisins, refresh me with apples, for I am lovesick. And what I see is, is in Christ, you have a very strong foundation that you're standing on. But, um, but what you need to see is you also have a banner of love over you, and you're squished in between. And, and God, I ask that you would sustain your people. There's some here today that are holding on by a thread. They're barely holding on, God, and I pray, God, that you would envelope them in your presence today, in your love, in your mercy, with your banner, God, that they would see it waving over them, sustain them, God. Come on. Yes, I know the right word. And so this morning, as I was asking the Lord about this morning, he showed me a promenade filled with people, like a boardwalk filled with people, and he was in their midst singing over them. When I asked him what he would have me say, I heard, I am the word, and you are the voice. I am the music, the melody, and you are the instrument. I am the song, and you are the singer. And you are also my gospel, my good news. You are my music. You are my song. Wow. Amen. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Good stuff. This will be difficult for some of you. If you don't want to stand, you don't have to stand, but just, just receive it. Um, that word, you know, that there's somebody that's holding on by a thread. You know, you know, when you walk in here, nobody can tell. You know, because you're smiling, and, you know, shaking hands and hugging. And uh, but sometimes there's just stuff going on inside, and uh, nobody knows about it except for you. And uh, so I wanted to take a minute to just recognize that. And. Um, I'm going to make it actually easy on you. I'd like everybody to just bow your heads, close your eyes. And if, if you resonate with that word and you're feeling hopeless and you just need renewed hope, uh, and that's the kind of thing God does daily with us. And so if, if that's you, I just want you to raise your hand. I'm going to just bless you and pray for you. Okay. So hands are going up everywhere. And uh, so that's, we have to be aware of that. That's what happens with people. That's what happens in life. You can put your hands down now. I'm just going to bless those people. I'm going to pray that God would, would minister to them, minister hope to them, strengthen them, help them to take that next step because sometimes that next step is the hardest step to take because you don't feel like carrying on. But carrying on is where it happens. It's as we step into Him, He steps towards us. And so, Lord, I just bless these people. It's dozen or so people would just raise their hand. I pray, Lord God, that you'd highlight them, you'd highlight them to other people, 
And uh, Lord, you make us sensitive to what you're doing and what's happening in the lives of our brothers and sisters. And Lord, let us be an encouragement to them. Let us be strength to them. Let us help them carry on in you when they can't carry on by themselves. So Lord, be with them, bless them, strengthen them now, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. When we have a time at the end for ministry, you know, I'd welcome you to come and get some more personal prayer and let people minister to you. We all need it one time or another, just the way it is. Hello, Edward. Maria, I didn't see you. Come in. Uh, I have some friends here from Pennsylvania and uh, that I met last year when I was at their church. And, uh, and they came out here this, this weekend from Pennsylvania to go to the Jesus Culture thing down in Long Beach. So I thought, wow. Yeah. That's all I'll say. Um, hey, last week we made you aware that Cheryl is no longer our, our administrator, and uh, and yet she is at church today. And I, and I, I, I take note of that because uh, I was ready to start keeping score of how many Sundays she missed. And, and, uh, but so far she's batting 100%. Um, and uh, Caitlin is going to be doing the administrative stuff during the week. And on Sunday, Amy Strong is the queen, is the queen of Sundays. So if you have a question or a need, you go to Amy and, uh, and not Caitlin. So uh, we just want to, and it's a little bit different situation now, so just want to make you aware of that. Okay? Now, I have the pleasure of introducing a long lost friend. Yay. <laughs> Are you doing that? Okay. John has been suffering from a bit of vertigo, vertigo this week. So if he starts swaying and twirling and falling down, it's probably not the Holy Spirit. <laughs> <laughs> Although maybe we'll trigger that. <laughs> so, I'm so glad to see you. I'm so glad to be I'm here. so glad when I woke up this morning and looked at my phone and there wasn't a text saying, you're preaching. Um, so uh, let's pray and bless him. Lord, I thank you for Don. I thank you for who he is, Lord, for the man that you made him to be and the man that you're continuing to make him be. I pray, Lord God, as, as he opens his word, your word, to us, Lord, that his words will be your words, Lord, that you grant him grace and anointing and favor. And Lord, that you would uh, touch our hearts and our lives and help us to move another step closer in our walk with you. So Lord, bless him now in Jesus' name. <coughs> and Lord, we just we do pray against uh, vertigo. We speak to vertigo until we're gone. And Lord, that purpose is equal to would be uh, perfectly right. And uh, Lord, strengthen him, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Morning. Morning. We're those friends of Carl's that are here from out of town. Uh, how long have y'all known him? Oh, about uh, uh, how many years? One. One year? That's all you've known him? Yeah. No, that's why you're his friends. That's awesome. <laughs> that's awesome. I was so blessed that he had some. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> <laughs> it's the vertigo, it's not me, I would never do that. <laughs> it's so weird, I, every once in a while I get this, and I'll be honest, um, I was with Jill Fidel, she's not here today, but um, I started getting vertigo, and normally when it happens, they actually hospitalize me because I just, I fall on the ground, cool dog, awesome, I love it. That's Barnabas. Barnabas? That's one of my favorite names, too. Hi, hey, Barnabas. Hey, buddy. Good boy. Yeah. Right in his tail. I have Jedediah. He's a white one of those. So, for those of you that are listening to this, if this doesn't get cut, there's a beautiful black lab up in the front row named Barnabas, who is an encourager. Right? Yeah. Okay, enough of that. Here we go. <laughs> so I got the vertigo. I never had to go to the hospital. I'm doing fairly well. And um, we'll see. I believe that I'll hold up well this morning. 
Um, you all know, back before we started having so many guest speakers, um, we were in the Book of Acts. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so we're going to go all the way back there to the Book of Acts again. Um, somebody gave us, Carl and I, a hard time a week ago because he said, you know, uh, basically he said we're taking it one verse at a time and are we ever going to get done? And, and, and honestly, as I was studying the passage for today, I thought, oh, I could spend weeks on this. Mm -hmm. But I won't. I'm going to actually try and cover a few verses more than normal today. And I just want to say, before I forget, before I begin, um, those words um, were right on. Okay, it, 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 it was amazing to me as I sat there and I listened to them, how faithful God is to confirm His Word. Um, you know, I, we study and we, we look at the Word and we know what we're going to say and um, you all didn't know what I was going to say and what I believe the Lord was saying to us this morning, but your words, um, if you've forgotten what they are, listen to this tape later and you'll see just how closely they line up with what I believe God is wanting to say to us as a people today. If you remember in um, Acts, uh, starts Jesus ascends, uh, he tells them to wait, he's going to send the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit comes. In verse 1, 8 it says the Holy Spirit came uh, to empower us to be his witnesses. Um, then uh, a few weeks ago we see that um, Peter and John go out and as they're going into the temple they stop at the gate beautiful. They see a man who's been there for over 40 years who was crippled. <laughs> And um, you remember the famous lines, silver and gold have I none, but what I give you, uh, but what I do have I'll give you, and that is Jesus Christ, and in his name, rise and walk, and the man is instantly healed, and begins jumping and leaping, praising God, holding on to them, just will not let them go. It's an amazing sight. And then what happens is, is Peter then preaches, because the people now come, and they're, they're, they can't believe it. They've known this guy. They've seen this guy every day at the temple gate. Many of them have given uh, money to him to help sustain his life. And now suddenly they're seeing this guy walking. Yeah. And, and it's like, you got to be kidding me. This is the most amazing thing. And so they, they notice that it, he's hanging on to Peter and John. And, and, and Peter kind of makes this, this, this statement. He says, well, why do you look at me as if I'm something? You know, it's Jesus that did this. He goes on to give a, a sermon, and the people begin to respond. And so we see now that um, the word isn't, uh, that Jesus isn't just to stay in this little building, right, where Pentecost comes, and they didn't just stay there going, yeah, let's keep experiencing this. They took that because they've been empowered now to go and do what Jesus has called them to do. And that's what we've been talking about. It's getting outside the walls. We were not saved to stay in here and a little huddle. Carl gave that illustration a month or two or three or four ago about how we're so good at huddling, but we never break huddle and go play the game. And I think the church has gotten to this place where they like to just huddle. And I, the picture I get is, um, if you ever saw the, the, the Ravens, I think they are, Ray Lewis, before the game, um, they would huddle and he'd go be yelling at them, here's the preacher, yeah, 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 and they'd all be getting excited and they'd all be jumping up and down. And, and that's kind of the church, we get all excited, we jump up and down, and then we go, okay, let's do this again next week. But there's still a game to play. And so we're seeing that the Holy Spirit, as we've received Him, has called us to now go get in the game. So why do we share the gospel? I mean, what's it about? Is it just so we get a notch in our belt, so we get a bigger church? So we get, uh, and sometimes I just, do you just stop and think, why should I do this? It's not just because I've been told to do it or commanded to do it, but so what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is this. If you've experienced Jesus in your life, you've experienced a change in you, and you can't help but do it. You can't help it. And we're going to see that in some of the stuff that we covered this morning. You see, why can't I help it? Because he's changed me. The things that I longed for in my life, I found in Him. 
He is the good news. That's what the gospel is. He is the good news. And so why would I not share it? You know, I remember the first time I went to Costco. You know, and it's like, this is awesome. It's like, look at all this stuff. And I told my friends about it. You've got to go get, become a member at Costco because you can save so much money. you spend a lot. But then it takes a long time to go through it. It's just amazing, okay? And so we get good news. We want to share it, right? So when we find something good, we want to give it away. We want people to know. And that's why we share the gospel. Jesus, it says in, in Matthew 9, it, it, he turned, he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. He grieved over them, for he knew what it was that he wanted to offer them, and yet they were like sheep that had gone astray, they were just being beaten up. The gospel says you don't have to be beaten up anymore. There's something exciting, there's something different, there's purpose, there's a reason. So Jesus came to restore relationship. So... That's why we get outside the walls. And so we've seen now that, that uh, Peter gets done with his sermon, and, and now for the first time we see that there's opposition that comes his way. And I just kind of want to pick it up. Actually, before I do that, um, my point was that Peter is um, a different guy here in Acts than what we saw earlier. If you remember um, just, gosh, a little over a month prior to this, Peter's the guy that told Jesus, he says, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. Remember, he's the guy that said, though everyone runs, I will not. Right, right. Remember that? And so now, he sees as Jesus is being tried and beaten, and, and he's actually confronted by a little girl, and he says, I never knew him. Denies him three times, just like Jesus said he would. So here you see this guy who, who believed that he was strong. He believed that, that there was nothing that could overcome his faith. And then we see that he so um, obviously disappoints himself. He falls and uh, he just, uh, he's, he's devastated. So we see that, that this was who Peter was just a little over 40 days prior to this event. A man who, was, uh, who thought he was something that he was not and now was just totally disappointed. And then Jesus, of course, comes back to him, calls him back, forgives him. And so now we see in Acts, let's start reading Acts 4. I'm going to read verses 1 through 21. And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them. They were greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard uh, the word believed, and the number of men came to about 5,000. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Church growth. On the next day, the rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Benaiah and Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, and John and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. And, they, and, they, and when they had set them in their midst, they inquired. Now imagine this, guys. These are the most powerful people in all of Israel. These are the same people that, sent, that took Jesus and tried him and had him murdered. These are the very same people when Peter was watching this, when someone confronted him, he denied he even knew Jesus. And now these same people are come walking up to him. They're not happy. They're ticked. And so he's watching these people that just murdered Jesus just over a month ago coming straight at him. They're the ones that he was scared to death of, right? So now they sit, it says they, they sit him in their midst. Can you imagine the picture? All of these guys in robes and looking really majestic and, and the most powerful men in Israel, and they set him in their midst. When they had set him in the midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, 
rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means is this man been healed? Then let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom, Jews, whom Jesus raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is a stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become now the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. Wow, wow. Yeah. But when they commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that is a notable sign that's been performed through them, is evidence to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. I love that line. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. And so after they had conferred together, okay, we're going to just give them a big stern warning, make sure we scare them off. So they called them and they charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But when Peter and John answered them, they said this, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge, for we cannot speak of what we have seen, and we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people who were praising God for what had happened. So here's Peter, this guy that denies Jesus, over a month later, now standing in front of the people that murdered Jesus. They are doing everything they can to scare him away. Wow. And Peter's response is anything but what it was before. Hey look, you gotta be the, be the judge of this whether we should obey you or God, but we're gonna obey God no matter what. And so they continue to try and scare them and here's this Peter who just says, no, I know what I've seen, I know what I've heard, and I can't help but speak of it. See, that's getting it outside the walls. That's saying, he has changed me. Yeah. Well, what had changed? How is it that Peter goes from a fearful observer to a bold, confident man of God? Yeah. Notice how Luke identifies those who are opposing uh, Peter and John. It says, on the next day, the rulers and elders described gathered together in Jerusalem, and he names the same people okay, that were opposing Jesus, that had denied Jesus. These were the same men. Yeah. Look again. At verse 1 through 4, and as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captains of the temple came upon them. They were greatly annoyed. I love that. <laughs> greatly annoyed is really kind of a way to say they were really, really, really ticked. Peter had no right. He had not been invited to come and speak. And now what he was talking about completely went against their theology. They didn't believe in the resurrection. And so he's preaching the resurrection. And they're saying, that isn't true. And he's saying, ah, but it is. You see, I've seen it. And so there was a change that took place in Peter. Well, what changed? How is it that Peter denies knowing Jesus just a little more than a month ago, and now he's standing before them? How is it possible? One of the things that I, I really want to drive home today, and, and some of you are in this place, I know because I've spoken to some of you. Some of you have kind of started to wonder about your faith. And have you ever wondered, have you ever doubted that you had it, or wished that you had more? Few things are more misunderstood than faith, and yet few things are more important. For faith to mature, it must be tested. That's what I loved about today's words. The word discomfort, you're losing your baby teeth. You're growing, you're, you're maturing, okay? Holding on by a thread. Some of us feel that way sometimes. You know, our, our faith, sometimes it's like 
Why do I believe what I believe? And we're tested in that. If I were to really give a title to this, I, to this talk, I'd say the testing of your faith mm -hmm. is what it's all about. Remember, Jesus at, uh, at the Last Supper says to Peter, he says this, he says, Satan has demanded this day that he be able to sift you like wheat. But I prayed for you that your faith would not fail, and when you return, go and strengthen your brothers. You see, there is, or there are at times seasons where God actually allows Satan to test you. But he, he says, he doesn't just give you total access, he says, I'm also praying that your faith will not fail. He didn't say that you will not fail. Some of you, maybe you failed, and you're feeling like God would never forgive you. I remember there was a time in my life that that's what I went through. I felt like I had done something so grievous to the Holy Spirit that I could never be forgiven. But you know, I, I didn't realize that Jesus is doing the same thing for me that he did for Peter. He says, Don, I'm praying for you. You're going to be sifted like we. Satan is going to come to you. And your life is going to be turned a little upside down. You may even make wrong decisions. That's what Peter did. But he said, I've prayed for you that your faith will not fail. Mm -hmm. And so we have Jesus who is our advocate before the Father, who is continually praying for you. So when you begin to be shaken in your faith, when you begin to wonder what it's all about, or even if it's real, know that that's okay, because Jesus is praying for you. I know that there's a time when your faith must become your own. There have been four people who have come to me in the last month in this place of questioning. Some have been raised in the church all their life. And they're saying, I don't know if it's really real. How do I know? And I, you know, with each one of them, I've taped, said the same answer. You're in a great place. And they look at me like I'm crazy. Because for them, no, don't you understand, maybe you didn't hear, Don. I don't know if I believe that God exists. That's an awesome place to be. That's an awesome place to be. Why? Because God is going to make your faith your own. Amen. He's going to take you from believing because somebody else believed and told you, to you knowing and experiencing and having it for yourself. So no one can shake it. Right. Do you understand that? There's a wonderful story that I came across as I was doing some research. And i got to share this story because I just think it's so good. It's the story of a young man visiting an older Christian. And I want to read it for you. It says, one day, a young disciple of Christ, desiring to fully receive all that God had for him, visited the home of an elderly Christian. He had heard that this old man had never lost his first love for Christ over all the years. The elderly man was sitting on the porch with his dog, <laughs> taking in a beautiful sunset. The young man posed this question. He said this, why is it, sir, that so many Christians zealously chase after God during the first year or two after the conversion? But then, they fall into complacent ritual of church once or twice a week. And they end up not looking any different than their neighbors who aren't even Christians. I have heard that you are not like that. And the old man smiled and he replied, let me tell you a story. One day I was sitting here quietly in the sun with my dog. And suddenly a large white rabbit ran across the field in front of us. Well. My dog jumped up, and he took off after the big white rabbit. He chased the rabbit over the hills with great passion. Soon, other dogs joined him, attracted by his barking. What a sight it was, as the pack of dogs ran barking across the creeks, up stony embankments and through thickets and thorns. Gradually, however, one by one, the other dogs dropped out of the pursuit, discouraged by the, dis by the course, 
frustrated by the chase. Only my dog continued to hotly pursue the white rabbit. In that story, young man, lies the answer to your question. The young man sat in confused silence. And finally he said, sir, I don't understand. What is the connection between a rabbit chase and a quest for God? The old man said, you failed to understand because you failed to ask the obvious question. Why didn't the other dogs continue in the chase? And to answer that question, they had not seen the rabbit. You see, the truth is, unless you see the prize, the chase is just too difficult. You will lack faith. You will lack passion and the determination to keep up the chase at times. And there comes a time in your faith that it must be tested. There comes a time when your faith must become your own. Some of you are living on other people's faith. Some of you maybe You've been raised in a Christian home and you've always been taught to believe and so you always have but then you kind of start to get outside the the safety of that and circumstances come your way that begin to shake you maybe friends come your way that begin to question you and you begin to wonder if what you believe is really true have you ever wondered about faith? Doubted that you had it? Wished that you had more? See, I'm just not concerned when people come to me with those questions. <laughs> because I know that God is working in them to make their faith their own. I remember when my daughter went away to college and uh, I prayed a prayer that um, when something like this Lord, I love my daughter. Please keep her from having to go through the things that I went through to become the person that you've made me to be. And I, I think I almost heard him laugh out loud at me. Um, and I realized the prayer was foolish because she had to go through some things to become the woman that he wants her to be and that I could trust him with her. Some of you are going through hard times and you're holding on by a thread. Some of you are starting to lose your baby teeth. The beliefs that you had because you were taught. And so I want to encourage you to look for God. It's important that you see the rabbit and he will show himself to you. Because he says, if you seek me, with all of your heart, I will be found by you. And so if you're in that place, I want to encourage you, you're in a place that is a good place. A place that God himself has allowed you to go so that you can test him and see that he's real. It's a difficult place, but it's a wonderful place. God desires to have a relationship with you that is unique to you. You know, it's, it's amazing. Each one of you is a unique creation of His. That He formed each one of you. And He formed you for purpose. And though I might look a little like my parents and my brothers, I'm a completely different person in many respects. My brothers were all very different and I was the most different they say I challenged everything you see it's okay for you to be you it's okay for you to question because God is bigger than your questions he really is and he's not only bigger but he loves you so much he wants to answer them and he will answer them for you and so if you're in that place I encourage you Hang on, don't give up, and look for him.
and you will find him. So are you chasing the rabbit that somebody else has seen? Have you avoided actually pursuing God because of uncertainty, doubt, or fear? I encourage you to look again at who Jesus is. Seek him with integrity. Allow him to show you who he is. And maybe today can be the day that you see him for yourself. Peter went on to say, verses 11 and 12, he said this, This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we can be saved. You see, to those who believe, this stone is what they call a cornerstone. It is the stone that is first laid when a house is built, and upon and around that stone, everything else is made. Everything aligns with that stone. And so Peter's saying, he is the cornerstone. He is the reference point. Everything evolves around him. Without him, if you reject him, it says he becomes the capstone. There's no other name. That's what Peter's saying. So you have to take a look at him. And he will be either the cornerstone, the, the, the person that you set your life around, or he'll become the capstone. And that means there's nothing else for you. You can look as long as you want. And you will never discover that for which you were really born. And that is the purpose of knowing him. And so he says to, to the Sadducees, he says, this stone, the one you rejected, is the cornerstone. In 2 Peter verse 4, or chapter 2 verse 4 through 7, Peter says it this way, he says, as you come to him, a living stone rejected by men in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifice acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in scripture, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe. You see, he's the only one. There's no other name given to men by which they can be saved. So if you're beginning to test your faith and question your faith, you're in a great place because God will show himself to be true. If you've never really considered him, I really ask you to stop for just a moment. Really take a moment to say, okay, if I had never been taught against him, if I had never heard all of the arguments against him and I just looked at the evidence for what it is, maybe there's something to it. It's not just a, a bunch of rules and going to church and dress in a certain way. Obviously, Carl doesn't. No. It, it's not. It's about you being you. It's that he's created you for purpose. He wants to know you. But he's the only one that can bring you to that place. There is no other way. There's no other name. Jesus was very clear about it. If you think you can find it in some other thing, go ahead and look. You will find it's empty. You just will. But when you've seen the rabbit, when you've seen him run, you go, I'll keep chasing because I've seen him. And I can't help but speak of what I've seen and what I know. He's real. He will change you. He will bring a purpose to your life that you never dreamed possible. And I hope 
that you will find him as well. And so, in conclusion, it says in verse 18 through 21, So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, Whether it's right in sight of God to listen to you rather than God, in, rather than God you must judge. For we cannot help but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them, punish them because of the people who were all praising God for what had happened. If you're questioning, those of you I know that raised your hand when Carl asked that question, you're in a good place. You're in a really good place. You're in a place that God will show himself true to you. Look for him. Look for him. Don't go by my word or anyone else's word. Don't run your race on what I've experienced. Run it on what he does in you. Because when he comes to you, he gives you a unique perspective of who he is. A perspective that only you can share with people around you. You can share your testimony of what you went through and how you saw him. And nobody can silence you. When my dad got healed, um, you all remember that story when my dad kind of got raised from the dead. Well, got raised from the dead. Um, and uh, I had been going to Pepperdine University at the time and I was in this drug and alcohol class um, uh, about addictions. And it was a rather large class, and the professor had been told um, that I wouldn't be there in class, the, the class prior, because I, um, my dad had died, and um, that I would be missing the class. And so then I come back to the next class, and I'll never forget, the, the professor says to me, he says, how are you doing? I'm like, great. <laughs> and he looked kind of puzzled, he says, what do you mean great? I said, oh, I'm just doing great. And this is in front of the whole class. And he said, well, I heard something happened to your dad. I said, yeah, it did. <laughs> and I, I said, he, he died. But then God rose him from the dead. Wow, wow. <laughs> and he said, tell us about it. And I go, oh, no, no, you don't want to know. Oh. You know, really. And I said, I really don't want to offend anybody in the class. Mm -hmm. And so... I'd love to tell the story, but please know that I have to tell you the whole truth. And so the whole class goes, yeah, tell us the whole truth. Yeah. And so I said, my dad did die. And for five days, he was in a coma, and they did all the tests on him. His brain was, about 90% of it was gone. They didn't even think he had enough brain function to continue breathing when we pulled the plug. And the next day, and I, oh, and I said, and so we prayed for him. And we prayed in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. No other name. We prayed in Jesus' name. And the next day, God raised him up. Come on. It was awesome. Yeah. I'm just telling you. I know what he did. You could never convince me different. I saw with my eyes my dad who was dead. And God raised him up. Amazing. Yeah. Now, I don't question much anymore about whether or not God exists or God heals. That's pretty much settled for me. Okay? Yeah, yeah. Just pretty much settled. <laughs> it's settled for my daughter. This is a beautiful thing. The first day I'm, I'm walking down the aisle with my daughter, they told me not to take her to see him. Because she should remember him the way he was. And this came out of my mouth. I can't tell you why. It's probably not wise, but that's okay. I'm walking down. I'm saying, honey, keep your eyes straight ahead. There's a lot of sick people in here. And I said, I want you to see Grandpa at his worst so you'll know what it is when God heals him. Wow. wow. I don't know why that came out of my mouth, but it did. Do you know the first person to get to see my dad as God was healing him? My daughter. Oh, my. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know that when she went through life, and even today, she says to me, Dad, whenever I begin to question, 
I remember what God did for Grandpa. Yeah. Wow. And it's settled. She saw the rabbit. <laughs> One of the reasons we pray for healing is so you will see the rabbit. Yeah. And so you will run after the healer. Not just for the healing, but for who he is. He's amazing. If you've never met him, I invite you this morning to meet him. He will show himself to you. If you've never said yes to Jesus, maybe today is the day that you see the rabbit. He will show himself to you, I guarantee you. For some of you, you're just stirring in your heart right now that you want this. And if the worship team will come up, some of you have been questioning, and that's okay, you're in a really good place. Don't give up the run. Keep running. God will show himself to you, I promise you. So some of you may just need prayer this morning because you've grown weary. You're holding on by a thread. It's not looking like what you thought it was going to look like. You know, Peter, Jesus at the end didn't look like what he thought it was going to look like. And he was shaken by it. But then Jesus comes back to him and shows himself. And Peter says, I can't help now but speak of what I've seen and what I've heard. It became his story. Right. And so this morning, maybe God wants to write part of your story. So as we sing a song, if you've never given your life to Christ, I don't know what in the world you're waiting for, but if you haven't, consider him this morning with new eyes. Pull back all the curtains of unbelief. Pull back all of the things that you've been taught all your life. All of the things that have caused you, all the questions that people have put in your mind. And say, okay God, if you're really real, if this is true, I want to see you this morning. So I encourage you, if you've never received Jesus, if you've never really seen him, or experienced his love for you, this morning may be that morning, so if you're feeling a tugging at your heart this morning, I encourage you to come forward. If you're going through a hard time, or you've never said yes to Jesus, today may be the day. So Mr. Team, if you'll come forward, and we'll pray for you. Every bit as good as any of the foreigners. So. 